Thank you, Rich, uh, Klaus, and John for the invitation. I've really enjoyed the meeting here. I'm, I'm not a surgeon, I'm a bioengineer, but I think I'm ready to do my first PAO when I get back, if I can <laughs> get, get in the OR job. Is that, is that right, this one? Thank you. So uh, the first three talks were outstanding in this session and set, sort of set the stage for me to try to answer this question. Can we develop a living joint replacement? And, and the answer is not yet but we have some tools that we've developed in the last five years or so that are really going to change how we can think about uh, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine for the hip. And the concept that we've tried to study in our lab is can we use stem cells and stem cell therapies to treat osteoarthritis and, and delay uh, total joint replacement? As most of you know, most of this work has been done actually in, oh, there it is, in, uh, in the knee, and there's very little that's been done in the hip except for what you've seen today. And really, this, the question that we're trying to address is a patient like this one from John Clovisi, where this 22-year-old has already had one joint replacement, and on arthroscopy you see that this is not a small lesion. The entire hip has delaminated, the cartilage is gone, and a, a focal therapy is not going to work. We need to work towards biological preservation of a joint like this one. And so where do we get stem cells? The history of adult stem cells is relatively recent outside of the hematopoietic system of blood forming. So in the 70s, it was identified by Friedenstein that there is a, uh, a, a non-hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow that can form fibroblast uh, colony forming units and can then ossify. And these cells were really popularized by Arne Kaplan. And he called them mesenchymal stem cells because he thought they were the origin of mesenchymal tissues. It's been proven not to be the case, except that in vitro, we can take these cells and form cartilage, bone, and fat, and either other mesenchymal tissues from them. Our lab, and then at the simultaneously, the Pittsburgh UCLA group found a similar but very distinct set of cells in adipose tissue. And what's been shown since then is that most adult tissues have this type of MSC cell, which turns out to be a pericyte, the cells lining capillaries in blood vessels that are multipotent. A huge breakthrough was in the development of the induced pluripotent stem cell, which we use very much in our laboratory, which is a, 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 the process by which a somatic cell, an adult cell, can be converted to an embryonic state through the transduction of four factors into those cells, four transcription factors, and basically you can make a pluripotent stem cell that can turn into any tissue type, and it has ma many advantages. So what is a stem cell? Well, I think we all know that a stem cell is a specialized cell that knows what you need, where you need it, and they go there and they become it. <laughs> and that's, of course, absolutely not true. And this is the, the real problem we have, especially in the United States, of these stem cell clinics that are just injecting uh, crud, as we call it, into the joints, in everywhere. And they're promising things that are, are just not true, that the cells will home to the site of injury, so they'll basically inject marrow or some equivalent into the bloodstream, assume that the cells will go where they need to, automatically do everything they need to do, and then not do things such as uncontrolled hyperplasia, ossify in, into a cartilage into a bone, uh, grow a mucus-producing nose in the spine, which has happened twice now by uh, implantation of olfactory stem cells for spinal cord injury, several cases of tumor formation, really horrible case of bilateral vision loss uh, a few years ago in a clinic in Florida, and numerous infections. And the problem has been that there's very few prospective blinded randomized trials, and less than half of uh, stem cell clinical trials are published and reported. So because of this, think if you took half your data and the bad half and dropped it. Everything you did would be significant and positive. So as a field, stem cell trials are, are uh, highly biased towards showing positive results because the negative ones haven't been shown. The other problem that we have, and this is recent data uh, from our laboratory, is that we think you know, stem cell therapies are really neither stem cells nor therapies. What's being injected uh, if you think about bone marrow uh, aspirate concentrate, BMAC, is one in 10,000 of those cells might be a mesenchymal stem cell. Now, if you isolate mesenchymal stem cells, which we do in the laboratory all the time, and then we run RNA sequencing on single cells, so this is about 3,000 individual MSCs, and we've measured two to 3,000 genes on every one of them, and they're mapped by cell type, by color, and what you see is it's not one cell. It's seven to 10 different cells, even in an MSC prep. So forget about bone marrow aspirate. An MSC prep is a whole mix of cells, of endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and other cells. Is there a stem cell in there? There's a few stem cells in there, but not many. So what we want to do is harness 
this regenerative property of stem cells in a way that's much more controlled. And what's being done now mostly is cell therapy, where cells are being injected in the body. Unfortunately, they're cleared very rapidly and, and don't have this therapeutic effect. So we focus more on a combination of tissue engineering and gene therapy, where we can combine cells, biomaterials, and molecules to regenerate cartilage and bone outside the body or inside the body, and we can modify the cells using gene therapy or genome editing to create cells that are basically supercharged, and we can get them to do what we want them to. So we saw a little bit about materials and hydrogels, and hydrogels, as you saw, are excellent for chondrogenesis, but unfortunately they have very weak mechanical properties, about 1% of those of normal cartilage. So it's very hard to think about resurfacing an entire joint surface with a hydrogel, although the cells, because it's 98% water, grow really well in it. There's been a lot of work done in our lab and others about using non-woven fibrous polymers. Again, hard to control their mechanical properties, their pore size. If it's nanofibers that are electrospun, the pore size is hard to control. So we've moved to textile processing. Think about weaving and knitting where you can get stronger properties. You can get things that are very tough and flexible. In 2D, it's a little bit difficult to control the geometry. And this is where 3D printing has made a, a great uh, impact but it's mostly on rigid materials, either rigid plastics or metals, which is great for replacing bone and other tissues, but not for cartilage. So our technology took a combination of many of these, and we came up with a technique called three-dimensional weaving. And so this is a system where we take 600 individual resorbable fibers, think of in, uh, sutures, basically, and they're woven into a one millimeter thick layer. Actually, we can vary the thickness and the size as much as we want, but what we end up with is a fabric that is porous, biodegradable, extremely strong, but flexible. And the, the cell, unit cell of the fabric looks like this. You can see it's woven in three dimensions. Because of that, we can infiltrate it with cells, and we can weave it tightly or loosely over a year and a half of tuning it. We got the material to match the exact properties of cartilage in tension, compression, and viscoelasticity. So once we seed stem cells on there, give them growth factors, we can now engineer constructs of cartilage that have functional mechanical properties. That acts like normal cartilage from a mechanical standpoint. Therefore, we have now an artificial cartilage grown from stem cells that is functional. So what we can do now is scale up, and using MR or CT, we can make a CAD-based mold and create, out of the same three-dimensional fabric, a woven scaffold that's the size of an entire hip surface. Seed it with stem cells now. This is from adipose stem cells taken from liposuction waste, human cells. And uh, once we have this grown for a few weeks, we can actually create a functional, life-size living cartilage replacement for the entire hip surface. Now, when we went to implant this in an animal model, as you just heard, the animal models we look at don't have the same sphericity of a human hip, and we had to take a step back and try to just uh, uh, implant a large defect and create a 10 millimeter defect on the hip of a dog. And to get it to stay in place, we 3D print a bone-like lattice underneath the fabric to hold it in place. And once we do that, we go to a, a large animal model, in this case, uh, a hound dog, which is about a 70-pound or 25, 30-kilogram uh, uh, weight, and create a large defect. And it was very exciting to see Frederick's uh, images of defects in human hips that look very much like the ones we're trying to address. So does it integrate? When we put the fabric in, into the bone, and wait for four weeks, you can see there's excellent integration into the bone. The bone grows into the fabric, holds it in place, not as great integration at the cartilage surface. We're a little less worried about that, and, and there's other techniques that we were hoping to try, but this is, I think, going to be a long-term problem of getting new cartilage and old cartilage to integrate. But with that, we went to this dog model where we have six-month and one-year data where we make a very large defect. Uh, so this is about a 10-millimeter defect on a 21, 22-millimeter diameter hip. And you can see the uh, cartilage construct is now placed in here. After six months, the unfilled defect is, uh, of course, not, not repaired and a lot of damage to the rest of the joint. And the filled defect looks really good, very smooth. It has a yellow coating. And we think because the cartilage is not true highland cartilage yet, it, uh, uh, other materials in the joint, like albumin, just stick to the surface. But with that, it's very smooth and functional. And when we look, all of our uh, primary measures were pain and function in these animals. And we can look at gait studies. You can see their baseline activity between the two groups. At six months, the implanted group has returned completely to baseline activity. 
activity, the uh, uh, control group without implants had uh, 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 still reduced activity. If you look at a pain index, there's a pain of surgery, but the implanted group by three months or so has basically returned to a no pain group. And then we did uh, force plate analysis, and this is basically telling whether the animals are limping or not. The top group is the implanted group. You can see within four weeks of the implant, there's basically no pain and no limping in any of our measures of forward loading and uh, vertical loading in these groups. So we're very excited about this. The concept, of course, would be that uh, if we can, to scale this up to the human size. And using these scaffolds that are uh, sized and hopefully off the shelf, we can get stem cells from adipose marrow, potentially even uh, autologous chondrocytes, although those are hard to get in the numbers that we need, create a scaffold like this that uh, we can implant and then uh, use it to resurface while maintaining uh, bone for, for the joint. Now, when we've been working on this, of course, I've worked very closely with John Clohissi and Jeff Neppel, Cecilia Pascal Garrido. We had some cadaver labs in dogs to look at how could we treat FAI. And we had an excellent lab where we said, you know, John told me, well, you don't see very many defects on the femoral head. They're, as we've seen at the meeting, they're all really on the acetabulum. So using the, that lab, we were able to just uh, create custom designed now sized uh, scaffolds which have a cartilage and bone layer for the acetabulum. And by printing these and uh, adding on the, the fabric on top and then using a, a mold to create, basically clean out the region that's the uh, defect, we can now implant the same type of scaffold in. So now we're, we're hoping to get some funding to uh, take this to an animal study and we'd love to talk to anybody about what you think the first indications should be. Should we look at the uh, acetabulum? Should we look at the femoral head? Should we look at osteonecrosis, we can make a rod that's very long that can actually be used to <clears throat> remount the dead bone and, and replace the cartilage. So this is on its way. It's in a startup company, by way of disclosure, that, that I founded, and we're, we're trying to get that using very simple uh, autologous cells, a very simple biomaterial PCL, to the clinic. Now, the issue is, and, and you're aware of this, if we take a material and a cell-based scaffold or cell-based cartilage, put it back in a joint that's inflamed, and these joints can be very inflamed after uh, osteoarthritis or, or injury, and there are all these inflammatory modulators, interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, metalloproteases. What we found is if we expose our engineered cartilage to even low levels, 100 picograms per mil of interleukin-1, you can see the cells are alive, but they make enzymes and stop making cartilage, and they just destroy our new cartilage immediately. So whatever had led or propagated that cartilage destruction will do the same thing to our engineered cartilage in an almost more sensitive way. So we thought, well, we have these scaffolds, these materials, how can we prevent the effects of inflammation on our new cartilage? And there's several ways to do it. As I mentioned, this scaffold is made of 600 fibers. So we actually were able to create fibers that are woven with drugs inside of them. And once these fibers are made, we can actually weave them into different parts of the scaffold. So we can have very site-specific and staged delivery of drugs. And in this case, it's sort of a burst release over a few weeks, uh, a few months at most, because of the protein delivery. And this could be very good for antibiotic uh, delivery. But for long-term cytokine, anti-cytokine delivery, it's very hard to load enough anti-TNF or anti-IL-1 into these fibers. So we switched uh, modes, and instead of delivering protein, we thought we can deliver a gene to the stem cells. And the way we can deliver a gene exactly to the stem cells on this scaffold is to attach a virus, a lentivirus, to the scaffold individual fibers. And we just glue it using polylysine. This is a coated scaffold. When the cells touch it, only the stem cells that touch it take in the virus and become transduced, and they express the gene that we want to. So what gene did we want to express? Well, we used a test system to express uh, inhibitors of cytokines, in this case, inhibitors of interleukin-1, which is IL-1-RA or Kinneret, Anakinra, if you know it. And we loaded it into a viral construct. So you can see the IL-1-RA construct. This is the gene that it expresses. But before it, we have what's called a tetracycline responsive element. So that means this gene is only on when we give the cells tetracycline or doxycycline, which is a, a stable form of it. So now we have a tunable and controllable system. So once this cartilage is made and it's in the body, we can actually turn on and off the delivery of IL-1-RA within the joint by giving low-dose doxycycline 
to the patient or the animal. And you can see the baseline levels, the full blast uh, gushing out of drug, which is on the order of almost a microgram per mil. And what we find is that this actually protects the cartilage from being uh, degraded by the IL-1. We incorporated this into the entire hip construct, and we were able to get a microgram per mil of IL-1-RA when we tuned the system up all the way. So this was very exciting because we now have a remote system of an implant that's in your body, in the joint, and we can exogenously turn on and off local drug delivery. The question, though, remains is that you have to know when to turn it on and off. And when we compare the different systems for delivering drugs, I like to make the analogy that if you have protein delivery, a drug delivery system, the standard one, it's like a leaky bucket. You put it in the body, the drugs leak out over time, and this is how an injection of IL-1-RA would work or an antibiotic delivery system. If we have a gene therapy with a, a constitutive promoter, one that's always on, you're just gushing out drug. And in some cases, that works. But in this case, you don't want overexpression of anti-inflammatory drugs continuously in, in your joint. If we have an inducible promoter like I just showed you, you, it's like a faucet. You can turn it on and off to different levels, but you have to know when to turn it on and off. So what we really wanted was the smart faucet, a cell that can sense inflammation and turn on drugs only when it senses this environmental uh, stimulus and turns it off when it doesn't need to do it anymore. And the way we did that is we look at the cell, again, I'm an engineer, so I look at the cell and I think of it as a, as a computer and like an iPhone, basically, and that we can program it. And we use a technique called CRISPR-Cas9, which allows us to go in and basically cut the genome at very specific spots, slice it open, and put in new parts of the genome. And what we were able to do is take our cell, modify the receptors so they sense TNF and IL-1, play with the internal gene circuits, and then put in as an output, we delete the inflammatory cascade, and in its place, put in a drug. So now when this cell sees TNF or IL-1, it makes the inhibitor of TNF or IL-1 automatically in a feedback control system. And I think of it as like an iPhone where we can just program these little apps, these short genetic sequences that tell it to do these, these types of things. So here's how we did it. Jonathan, my grad student, who's now faculty at Vanderbilt, basically looked at the TNF and IL-1 pathway, uh, basically wanted to make a, a, a feedback loop in the system. And so when we looked at the genes that were expressed, this one gene, CCL2, which is a, a chemoattractant for macrophages, is one of the main genes that's activated by TNF. And so what we did was cut that gene open and in its place, put an inhibitor of TNF. So this is basically the gene equivalent of the drug Embril, if, you, if you're familiar with that, for rheumatoid arthritis. It's a soluble TNF receptor that blocks TNF. So now whenever this cell sees inflammation, instead of turning on inflammatory cascades, it turns on the drug that shuts off inflammation. And what we showed in various systems is a tissue system. You can see with increasing dose here and time, we make lots of the drug and it accumulates, and the gene expression goes up, and then it shuts itself off once it's turned the drug uh, up enough. And then what we wanted to do was now deliver this to the joint or to an animal, and we just engineered these stem cells into that cartilage construct. So this can go into a joint, into a defect site, where we wanted to test it, actually, was not yet in, in uh, osteoarthritis, but in rheumatoid arthritis, where we know these drugs are actually important and functional. So inhibiting TNF and IL-1 can have an effect in rheumatoid arthritis. It's an autoimmune, autoinflammatory disease. And so for that, we used a mouse model of rheumatoid arthritis as a test case. We just put that cartilage implant that I showed you in the back of a mouse, and it glows. And what we found was that our, our uh, constructs with the uh, edited stem cells, that's the red line here, the animals showed no increase in pain sensitivity with rheumatoid arthritis, about a 40% decrease in their arthritis score, and a complete inhibition of bone erosion that's caused by rheumatoid arthritis. So really promising, we have to up the dose a little bit, but that's easy to do with increasing gene numbers and, and uh, uh, numbers of cells. So again, we think about this as an iPhone, and I, I, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the details, but we've made a number of different apps that are into these cells. You, you saw the one, Find My iPhone. It's a luciferase, so we can see where it is. It has a signal intensity, so the more drugs it makes, the brighter it glows. Uh, we have an airplane mode, so you can temporarily shut it off. So if you're having surgery, you don't want these drugs on, so we have a tetracycline off system to temporarily stop the drug production without having to remove it. We have a self-destruct button. If these stem cells get away, you just give an innocuous drug, Ganciclovir, it kills all of them for safety. 
We've created a force touch sensor based on mechanosensitive ion channels. And then we've now done a really complex system using non-coding RNAs to turn on multiple drugs that are multiplexed using a, a bifunctional promoter. So this way, it can tell the difference between IL-1, TNF, IL-6, IL-17 to deliver the right drug in a multiplex system. So with that, I'm going to go to the Santori 5% information take-home rule. <laughs> so this is the take-home. We can create these large cartilage or osteochondral constructs with defined functional properties and geometry. What should we do first? Should we uh, try to look at focal defects in the femoral head, in the acetabulum? It's going to be a couple of years before we get to total hip resurfacing, but we would love to do that. And then we can create synthetic designer stem cells with logic circuits, gene outputs that are controlled. We can make almost any biologic drug that the body can make. What would you like to see? What drug should we be delivering to joints? I'll conclude there. Really, my phenomenal lab that has done all of this work and really enjoyed being at WashU with the environment there and the fantastic hip group, and couldn't have done this without funding and uh, a number of collaborators. Thank you. <laughs>